and they're off. If you need an awesome pack or bottles or flasks for your next big or small adventure, look no further than Ultra Spire. Bryce Thatch has been making the very best in hydration vests for the last 41 years and they just keep getting better. Head to www.ultraspire.nz for more and you would have seen if you'd read the Substack, if you're a paid subscriber, me raving about the Ultra Spire Epic XT3 fast packing pack which was used at Tarawera to set the FKT on the much vaunted car park down the road to aid station uh, in the Redwoods fastest known time. I heard, Kelly, I heard Kellyanne's coming after you. Uh, the Purple Pills, Currents. Matt, you've been on them for ages. I've got on them. They make you feel gooder. New Zealand's black currants are... They're just ace. They really are. Head along to currents.co.nz to read up on the science behind these wondrous little purple pills. You get 20% off with your first order of Currents 30s with the code Further Fast is the best independently owned outdoor store in the known universe. Whether you are heading out on climbing, paddling, tramping, dog husbandry, or running adventures, look no further than Further Faster for all your gear and expertise needs over the summer. Head to 57A Buchan Street, Sydenham, O Tutahi Christchurch, or hit them up at furtherfaster.co.nz. Like further Faster, they're in Christchurch. Rocky is hairy and so is Badger. Jules is nice and Jack is delicious. Go to Further Faster now. Oh, further Faster, they're in Christchurch. Rocky is hairy and so is Badger. Jules is nice and Jack is delicious. Go to Further Faster now. Church Radio. Episode 266 of Dirt Church Radio. I'm Matt Raymond. And I am Eugene Bingham. Tēnā koutou katoa no mai hoki mai. We made it. Let me paint you a scene, listeners. We're sitting in a... Fogged up. Fogged up Subaru Legacy. Uh, at a trailhead in Riverhead. It is raining. I have been doing hill repeats and came back to the car and waiting for my mate to turn up who's injured, waiting for his Subaru, yes we are those guys, uh, to turn up, <laughs> and uh, who should I see on a bloody bicycle? Yes. Rips over, he's ridden over here in the rain from home, can't keep a good man down, Eugene Bingham. Mm. How good, bought the podcasting things in mm. the pack. Yeah, shove them all in the back of my, I, I, as I, when I pulled up I said to you, Matt, I didn't really think this through, uh, I hadn't counted on it being raining. I hadn't counted on the number of numpty drivers between here yes. and home. However, I made it, and hopefully I'll make it back home again. Because if you listen to this, I made it back home again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or he didn't, and we put it out in his memory. But <laughs> Someone scraped it off the road. Please don't. We shouldn't joke about that. No, anyway, anyway, not. anyway. How how are you doing, Matt? Yeah, I'm good. I am uh, tired. I'm tired, but I'm good tired. I was just saying to Eugene, he... Well, you just said to me as you pulled up, you don't look like you've been for a run. That's I had 15 minutes, got changed. I'm tired, I'm good tired. Had the come down from Tarawera, as most people have this week. Yeah, no, no, no complaints. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, let's not get into as woe well as us, but it's quite a thing standing all night on a mic, isn't it? <laughs> you don't get the medal, so you, you can't really claim anything. But yeah, it's 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 all just a, it's a bit of an endurance event in itself, isn't it? So yeah, like as I say, not not trying to um please don't not pleading for pity tears here, but yeah, I was pretty wasted for 
till at least probably Wednesday, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just catching up on sleep and whatever. But it was it was good. And it was just such a great weekend and seeing so many people and catching up with, you know, lots of heaps of good sorts and watching some amazing racing and getting out on course. And it was, it was yeah, it just filled the trail cup that I'm missing through not being able to run at the moment. Mm-hmm. So it was great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was. I... I think for me, highlight and and talk about, you know, do the mahi, get the treats. I really want to reflect. You get looked after really well at Tarawira. Mm. And, um, man, best cup of tomato soup I think I've ever had. You were raving about that tomato soup. Yeah. You were raving about that tomato soup. Anyway, look, we did we we missed out the 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 kind of downside of being injured and, and you haven't been sick is we didn't get to go to Old Ghost. And no. I was absolutely gutted all week about that, about not going down. I must say, when I saw the Until. course change, yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, you, you know, the weather forecast, and as it turned out, there was rain in the second half of the of the race for most people. But looks forced organisers to switch to an alternative course, which is always a absolutely gutting call, especially for race directors. I think it's the first time ever. I think it is, yeah. Mm, yeah, they, they, I mean, they've obviously had a bunch of disruptions and distractions because of the old Rona, but you know. It, the old ghost we will get there we promise it feels like the race we never quite make it to but we will get there we promise mm. and we can't wait and it's just sort of like it's like you know waiting for, waiting for christmas absolutely no, no. absolutely yeah and it looks like people had such a good time down there despite the course change it became an out and back in case you didn't know the rain looked like it set in the second half of the day people were pretty wet by then but still uh i saw at the start line people were just in in shirts and singlets and so on so kind of been cold by the looks although i'm notoriously bad at making assumptions about whether it races and it's the south island so and it is south, much, yeah, yeah so i'll i'll just um stop there probably but how was the point end of the film man yeah and the women's kate loy taking it home 732 followed by allison wilson and uh dcr fave nancy jang so oh. Sharp, sharp, running all of all of those stunning human beings uh, within the top ten. Yeah, yeah. And in the men's, uh, Thomas Barnes, seven oh four fifteen. He he crossed the line. I was watching the coverage. He crossed the line. Looked completely comfortable. Then went and sat down and was just like, oh. <laughs> his body had just gone. <laughs> okay, we're done. The central governor theory <laughs> yeah. in full effect. <laughs> yeah, it looked quite dramatic. And the people doing the live footage were like, they did an amazing job. By the way, they were like. Yeah, we'll just we'll just leave him for a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, but Nat Anglim was second, and Chris Donnell third. Old mate Louis Schindler. Yeah, got to talk about him. I mean, what a dude! Uh, yeah. second Masters, seventh overall, and that was backing up from uh, f- running a, a tidy four hours oh six at Tarawera fifty k the week before. He's unstoppable, wasn't he? And just another quick update: Mark Ford, who we mentioned in the previous episode of DCR, well. There's been a couple of episodes of DCR, actually, since our yeah. last normal episode of DCR. But anyway, you know who I'm talking about, Mark Ford, who was racing and raising money for the Stroke Foundation. He looked like he had a solid run as well. I was, I was checking to make sure he got home. And, yeah, he, he did, and, and looks like he, he had a good race as well. Now, look, we've asked a special correspondent, seeing as we couldn't come down, Conrad Langridge, to report in and let us know how it was done there. So take it away, Conrad. Eugene and Matt. G'day boys, um, this might take a few cuts but um, here we go, my uh, I guess report, race report and event report from the Old Ghost Road. Look, the course itself is just amazing. Look, th- this year we were running an alternative course uh, because of the weather system that came in. So basically we had to, we ran out a marathon distance out to Stern Valley at 42k and then we turned around and we had to run back. Um, This meant there were basically three main aid stations and then one sort of small interim aid station which just had water. Now, a lot of us thought when we first, you know, heard about the the race change that it it would be a much easier course. But, you know, talking at the um, prize giving and talking to other athletes that had done it again, you know, this course, the course change was actually possibly even harder than the original course because the first half, especially the first 25k, has a lot of stones. Um, rocks and stones, you know, kind of <laughs> among the defining features of the course, um, there's a lot of a lot of wear and tear on the feet, um, which made it super challenging. Probably, 
well, there's a couple of favourite sections, really. The judge hanger and the boneyard over the other side um, are exposed and rocky and really awesome. You get pretty high up. Kind of not easy descents and, and sort of, I guess, walking climbs up the hills. So, you know, none of it's been easy, but they're very exposed and, and they're really pretty. The the beach forest was just was probably the most favourite section. There were quite a few, quite a lot of beach forest, and you know, for a, I guess for a, for you know a few hours on the on the course, you might be on your own, and all you can hear is you know your own breathing. You can hear the tuis. You watch the wickers walk past, just like chickens are just wandering all over the place. The wickers, you see them all over the place, and they're awesome. And then you know you know in the back end of the course when the rain came. It was awesome. You could hear the the sound of the waterfalls and the 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 white water. It was absolutely stunning. So you know the rain, you know it didn't really detract from the course. It came in the second half, and it just made you much more appreciative of you being out in the wild, close to nature. It was absolutely awesome. Just just one more key thing about the event. I I guess the thing that makes this event so special, and this isn't going to help your FOMO boys, <laughs> but you know this event, Phil Rossiter puts his heart and soul into this event. He has got to be the best race director in the country. Everything is meticulously planned. Everything, the drop bags are labelled. They've got your race number on them. It is idiot proof, okay? The black drop bag is for your halfway point. They give you another drop bag, which is waterproof with a, a you know, a sealable, you know, adhesive, and you just rip that off and it goes back to start. It is bulletproof. They write all the numbers on you. There's a there's a woman at the finish line that puts your medal on. She sits you down. She gets you a drink. They bring your drop bags out. These people, these coasters, they cannot do enough for you. They are so proud of their event, and they're so proud of hosting people and bringing, you know, visitors, even Aucklanders, to their part of the world. It, it, it they make you feel very very special. In terms of my race, look, it it was. Probably the best um, ultra race I've run, you know, and I think probably the big part is I didn't really have a race plan until about 50k when I figured, okay, I've taken the first half easy, what do I want to achieve today? And Matt, uh, Eugene, I did math on the run in my head, yes. (laughs) I figured that if I could get to the specimen point aid station with 17k to go, if he got there with you know, two hours and 20 to go. If I'm running seven minute, seven and a half minute Ks, I would probably be able to squeak under 11 hours. And, you know, it, it is just, I got into race mode. I joined up with another runner, Mikey. Shout out to Mikey. He's a good lad. Um, running his first ultra and we just chugged along and blitzed along and came in in, in 10.43. So absolutely delighted. But this event, you know, you guys have to get down, you know, really keen to come back. This is this is hands down my favourite ultra. These guys make you feel real special. So get along, come along. It is brilliant. Thanks, mate. That was awesome. Look, I must say for the record, I have an apology to uh, give to you, Eugene, last episode of the aid station. Uh-huh. Um, there was a, you, you would have picked up if you're listening, a bit uh-huh. of tension when I was <laughs> saying, no, you leave Ruth Croft alone. She's nice. She doesn't give us any modicum of, of shite about not going to Old Ghost, and then you sent me the uh, harassing text messages. Yeah, that yeah she that's right. In, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my DMs on Instagram <laughs> was with Cross. Exactly. Going, I am going to keep at you. So there we go. That was just evidence that I, I was, yeah, I was right to be cautious. But anyway, apology accepted. Yeah. So look... Uh, with an event, you know, and we promise we will tail off through Tarawera, but there's a lot to talk, there's a lot to take in, and, and a, a big race, and a lot, a of, lot people. of people contacting us, and plenty of chat, and it's only been, you know, it's only been 10 days, and we've had some amazing feedback, thank you very much, and some very, very kind words, but one person we heard from was Thomas Evans, who had an encounter with one of the pros, like Ben Fraser reported us last week, and here's what Thomas had to say. Just back home to Whangarei after another awesome weekend with friends at Tum. The alternative course for the 102k gave the final wave of 50k runners a good opportunity to share the trails with the elites as they effortlessly glided past us. Dan Jones out front was epic, but one of my everlasting memories of Tarawera 2024 will be the ever-modest Ruth Croft as she passed us in the forest before Green Lake. It was quite narrow and my running mate was slightly ahead and on the right-hand side. I called out, move left, there is a... 
as I spoke, I realised who it was and immediately star- was immediately starstruck. Ruth Croft coming through. There is a Ruth Croft coming through. That's yeah, there, there was. Uh, his his move to the, he his move left was perfectly timed, and she gave him a wave of acknowledgement. Thanks. A small moment like this epitomises what I find so addictive about the sport. As a massive sports fan for all my life, but relatively new participant, being both a participant and spectator simultaneously is incredible. Particularly when the elite are so humble and respectful to the whole field, the participation, friendship, and community is what matters in this sport. Ruth Croft today paused mid-interview on the podium to applaud a miler coming in, even when Ali hadn't realised it was about to occur. An awesome weekend, and have already and already have plans to return next year. Thanks, it, Thomas. Yeah, it it is it is the only sport where you can actually it's, it's you know you'd know it if you played a game of rugby. Uh, again, you'd hopefully be on the same team as the All Black in the field, but do you, you know you'd yeah. know it if Scott Barrett tackled you? That would not happen. But being in the same race of field as the elites and 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 to speak to the the quality of Ruth Croft I mean she was at the finish line with yep. us till early hours of the morning yeah that's right and you this is the thing all these ultra fans all these sort of people there's Ruth Croft just on the finish line leaning up against the the barriers like everyone else shooting the breeze and applauding mm. and just hanging out it's so yeah. good yeah absolutely so good absolutely yeah hey look we didn't fill you in on the run of Troy Sachs Zach Friedley and Matt Bryson who were on our title winner special that came out last Monday and who were promoting access to races for adaptive athletes. Matt, of course, was running his first ever trail race and he and Zach and Coach Eric all ran together the 21k and they absolutely smashed it. They did 4 hours 20. We saw them out on course and it was just incredible. Whereas Troy was running the 50k and 7.49. He, I mean, the man's he's unstoppable and... Mm. Yeah, sort of watch out world, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it speaks also, as, as reflecting on this, and, and not, to, you know, comparison as the thief of, of, of whatever, but thinking about the difference in Matt, Troy, and Zach's experience, and this is something mm. to highlight as well, this was the 10-year anniversary of Matt actually losing his leg. Mm. So Matt wasn't born with, uh, you know, one leg. He, he, he was a- able bodied four limbs and, and lost that limb mm. in a very traumatic circumstance actually but uh, my goodness me what what, what strength what yeah. courage awesome Matt right this week an interview we recorded down at Tarawera Polly Taylor oh my god what a weapon <laughs> so, so, I, I, and I worked out that I, I met Polly once yeah. at, at uh, Kepler I mean she's Excellent. You she, wouldn't forget. She she can talk the iron legs off a stove. Uh, she's sixty four years old. She's an endurance junkie. Her day job in, involves guiding people on the Marlborough Hills. In two thousand eighteen, Polly secured an entry into UTMB, but just a few months before the race, she was hit by a car and suffered several broken bones and a TBI that would take nearly four years. Traumatic brain injury. By the way, thank you. Sorry, it would take nearly four years to recover from. I mean, against all odds, Polly's not only back running. She's back. She was lining up to complete uh, the miler and uh, she was hoping that she can be on the start of her journey back to the UTMB uh, this is a conversation about you know gosh resilience grit spit stick to um, with I mean we were just our jaws yeah. were hanging open we? yeah and, and lust for life as yeah. well you know just yeah. just like yeah get after it yeah yeah you'll love it greatest, greatest run, run ever, ever. Greatest run ever. And you'll love this. Greatest run ever, which is the part of the show where we ask you to write into us and tell us your greatest run ever. It doesn't have to be a race or a mountain summit. It might just be a run around the block. Something that's sung to you for some reason. Send them in to us at Dirt Church Radio at gmail.com. And this is from Tanya Rosendorfsky. Kia ora. I've been so inspired by so many greatest runs ever that I started to think what my greatest run ever was and hope this can help inspire someone else out there. To give a bit of context, I've never been a runner at all. In fact, I hated it, and I saw it more as a boring chore. I rather went into the mountains and pursued rock climbing, mountaineering, and particularly ski mountaineering. I felt strong until this one little incident in 2020 when someone ahead of us pulled off some rocks. I was hanging on a steep section unroped when one of those rocks hit my head. Thanks to my helmet, I didn't lose consciousness, and my well-trained body managed to hold on. We finished the climb, but my life would change forever after this. I really struggled returning to my passion no matter how hard I trained and I started to feel weaker physically and mentally. I was drained from trying hard over and over again to preserve what I felt like it had gone. On one of those frustrating mornings after another failed attempt the day before I decided to put my running shoes on and go as far as my legs would carry me. 
I downloaded some inspiring podcasts on one of them being an episode of Dirt Church Radio. I can't remember the episode, but the story and the greatest run ever really kept my motivation high. I ran up the hill, which was tough, and then along the familiar trails of the Port Hills. It's crazy how your perspective changes from biking and using these trails as access for climbing all the time compared to just feeling the ground under your feet and responding to it. I felt the cold wind in my face clearing my mind and drying the tears that were streaming down my face as I let my mind flow at the same pace as my legs underneath me. I felt so freeing and for the first time I could let go of the grief that I was holding so tight. In the end I finished aching and happy at 21k, a distance I would never have thought I was capable of. Running has changed my perspective on things a lot and I'm very grateful for it being part of my life now. It has created more moments of suffering and hard work but also more moments of intense joy. It helped me feel strong again which has allowed me to return to mountain climbing and it has all started on that one day in the Port Hills. Wow Tanya, thank you so much. See what an impact your greatest runs ever can have and I'm sure lots of people will be inspired by your one there. It's, yeah. It, I mean, we, we always say, don't we, running is not counselling. Running is not counselling, but it can... Intensely therapeutic. Actually. Yeah, it can be very helpful, and it's proved the case there for yeah. Tanya. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, the rest of you, hope that maybe someone out there is being inspired right now by what Tanya just had to say. Send us your greatest run ever. Send it into us, dirtchurchradio at gmail.com. And we put them up on the website too, and you can have a, have a read of them there. Speaking of inspiring, let's just stand back, I guess, and yeah. get on with this epic yarn with the one and only Polly Taylor. So we were just talking about our various fears about uh, Australian fauna and mainly snakes, but also probably spiders, scorpions, um, Tasmanian devils, if, you, if you're so inclined. But Polly Taylor, welcome to Dirt Church Radio. Thank you for sitting with us. Oh, and my pleasure. Um, I I was quite shocked when uh, I got the call to come and speak to you guys because I went, "Holy shit, this is this is going to be harder than the hundred mile race tomorrow." So um, everybody's saying you'll be okay. I said, "Oh, I'm not sure about this one." <laughs> we're not. Thank you. <laughs> surely we're not that punishing. But um, I've met you before at, at Kepler a few years ago, and I know that you can you can spin a good yarn. So I wouldn't hide your line under a bushel. <laughs> Well, I guess if you're a guide in the Marlborough Sounds um, and you've got, and the world's opened up again, which is amazing. So you've actually got about a, a talk and that's probably something I needed to do um, mm. or I can do. Um, Steve Gurney once said to me on Old Ghost Road, he said, you know, Paul, if you stop talking, I'm sure you could run faster. Smart <laughs> bastard. <laughs> Steve Gurney of all people says yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's got a talk. I think we were, you know, competing on, on not on the running factor, but just on the on the, the talking, and I was probably beating them. So um, on that department, but mm. yeah, no, it's um, look, it, yeah, you just got to get out and enjoy all your runs and and whatever you do, it's 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 pretty awesome, and uh, yeah, so we're lucky. So take us back to that. You said you your day job is guiding people in the Marlborough Sounds. Yeah, absolutely. I work for a company called Marlborough Sounds Adventure Company, and I've probably been with them for eight or nine years. Um, I'm also a, a coach, personal trainer or a holistic movement coach. So I train all sorts of people, motivate them and so on. But um, being a guide is, is, is awesome. You know, like you, you pick them up. Um, the biggest crew I've had is 15 and that's a lot for one person. Um, and, but to be fair, these were all Australians. And um, I think out of any group, and I've, you know, I've been doing it a long time, but this group always comes back to my mind. Um, even when I had the accident, um, 2019, they were the first to get in touch. Um, and they end up by being my sponsors as well. So um, they were a, a health and well-being. Um, there was 15 women, hilarious women. Um, the uh, Kim Morrison, who's married to Danny Morrison, the cricketer. Um, and then, of course, they didn't know who I was, and they went, oh, Danny's only got one kidney. And how do you know that? I said, oh, I've been watching cricket for years. Um, Karen Smith, she was one of the Bali bombers that um, has got a story of her own. And Cindy O'Meara, um, she has a company called Changing Habits. whole heap of beef and sheep farmers, and they were just awesome. Um, 
but yeah, and I have all sorts. I have, you know, there could be Germans, there could be English, um, Americans, um, or, you know, all sorts. So it's a four and a five day hike. So for a hundred mile, uh, you know, training or racing, it's perfect because it's time on your legs. North Burn 100 miler, it's the best training you can ever have because it's day three on the Queen Charlotte. Is, um, yeah, it can be anywhere between six hours with a group or 10 hours if you've got a sick one on board. Um, and it's awesome for Northburn. Uh, we had to change a little bit for Tarawera because Tarawera is, is quite flat for me. Um, I'm used to climbing 40,000 metres um, up and down, up and down sort of thing. So I've got to learn to take myself a bit careful tomorrow. <laughs> Goodness me. Well, I'd like to. Uh, there's several things I'd like to pick out of there, but the phrase, if you've got a sick one, springs to mind <laughs> who would in their right mind turn up to the Marlborough Sound sick um, it's not so much sick they have um, they haven't really they don't realise how hard day three is right? and so they've underdone themselves and I always know day one who is going to go on day three or do I put them on a boat Right. Um, and then I just quietly sort of say, look, you know, day three is a little bit like this. And I show them the map. And But I said, it's your call. I will always get you through. Um, but you, you know, you have to make that call. So mm. you do get people that are un- underprepared. Um, and, um, yeah, it's there's, there's never a dull. Every trip is completely different. That's quite hilarious where they might leave their backpack behind and you've got to go run up, look <laughs> find it run back again and so yeah there's all sorts of stuff you know but it's awesome you know it's awesome people are great and you get you get nice people you know it's the thing mm. what what i mean what are we talking about here in terms of so for those who don't know marlborough sounds describe the route um so you st- we start off at uh Mochka island which is a um a native bird island and so the kiwis the baby chicks so we explore all of that first my favorite are my penguins because i like to you know i like to see them um you know from when the the mums are sitting there hatching the egg and then when the egg gets hatched and so on and so on there's a bit of a um the, the penguins are quite funny because it's a pecking order so it's first in first serve gets the box um, and one old girl, she took a long time and she dropped her egg right up the top. And so I picked it up and put it in the box. Don't want it now. So anyway, <laughs> that was okay. But so there's there's a lot of history there for that island. And that's where Captain Cook actually um, first went. And then he went to Ship Cove and um, he went there five times. So there's a lot of history, a lot of history in the bush and, and you know, predator-free stuff and and, um, and so on. Our, our, um, the Kiwi chicks are put on the island. Um, and then when they... Um, as a juvenile, when they get bigger, then they go out to the big island because they the rats won't get them because they know how to fend for themselves. And then so the day the first day is Ship Cove to Ferno, and it's it is really glamping. So all the gear is carted in by Cougar Line um, boats, and and I carried the billy and the big backpack with the first aid and all their extra stuff that they need and so on and so on. One day it was six litres of water and I went, mm, it's going to be a challenge, I because my guy was under prepared for day three and I had to carry his back plus all his water. So um, anyway, we got him through. Day two is just easy. It's um, Punga to, I mean, it's Ferno to Punga um, and they can do whatever they want. And then, but day three's all go. So you've got to be on the track by quarter to eight. That's me. I make them get on the track by quarter to eight and then head off to Portage. And um, it, it is a big day. It's like, it is like eight hours to 10 hours. And then the next day they can go kayaking around the mussel farms and so on. And then uh, last day it's Portage to Anakiwa. Again, we can't muck around because we've got to catch a boat. Um, and then celebration at base camp. So... Uh, then I might have to go back into Portage and get another crew and bring them out or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. it's time on your legs. I found it really tough last year. I did North Bend 100 miler and I, I actually did okay. And then I got the call, uh, could you come home and do a day's guiding? I went, yeah, that'll be fine. So 30K and I recovered from North Bend really well. And then after that, no, I was gone. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I'd pop big time. It was like, what? <laughs> um, then I had a week recovery and then back out guiding again. So, But January this year has been five days on, one day off, five days on, one day off for, wow. for a month. But my days off, thanks, James, was um, uh, PT Collective, which is like a boot camp, and then a three-hour run. So, um, yeah, they were quite – and then back out guiding. So there was no time off the legs. So, yeah, we've had the build-up, so we'll see what happens. Mm. So you mentioned UT uh, – sorry, Northburn. Yes. Um, you've won there. It's obviously a special – Yeah. It's a, it's a special place for you. It is. Um, our family had a big um, high country sheep station up the Rangitata Gorge called Ben McLeod Station. And mum and dad had four girls. Um, I left boarding school and went away mustering. And so I had a team of seven dogs and mustered all around Amarama, Monica, and then went up to the Marlborough. And that was a very different country. But it is, it is I, I like it because of the hills, you know. It's um, And I'm sure I'm going to like tomorrow, you know. But it's just, it's it's a challenge. You know, if you don't do it right, you will be carted off. Um, and the DNFs are horrendous, and that's why it's the toughest in the Southern Hemisphere. So, um, yeah, and we did get UTM points, the old system. Um, so my goal was always to get my points for for UTMB, and then I, I did uh, did that one in 2018. And yeah, I mean, I I'm not sure what happened to everybody else, but I won the Open. It was like, no, you got this wrong. There's got to be someone else out there. But and then I went over and did UTA. 100 in Australia and yeah it wasn't you shouldn't do that but I still ended up okay mm. um, but I got I got points enough points and then I got picked for UTB in Shimini which was going to be going to be my my big day we'll, we'll come come to that but I just want to pick up just to pick your brains while you're here you said if you do it right then it can go well but what does that mean in the hills at North Bend, how do you do it right and how do you do it wrong? Um, you really have to look after yourself. So um, I always say to myself when I'm running, I need to be ha- having a board meeting with myself so it's zone two. Um, you run everything that's runnable but every hill you walk because it can be all over in the first 50K because – Northburn's an interesting race. You've got Spaniard grass, what you know, it it cuts you up. You've got there's no animals, which is fine, um, but you've got those hills. Just they take it out of you, and it's really, really hot, like really hot. And then the nights are really, really cold. So um, if you do it right, you know in the first 50 that you've had a really good 50 because you've come in with a PB and you go, okay, you need to look after yourself because the race still hasn't started because the next climb is like 25K straight up. And when I first did it, I actually messaged my my two girls and said, I FaceTimed them and I said, you better have a look at this. And I said, you know, I have two choices here. I'm either going to heaven or I'm going to end up in the cockpit of a triple seven Air New Zealand plane with the captain. So I said, oh, there's just no let up. And there was no let up. Um, and then you sort of, you you come into the dark zone and, and it's cold. You know, it is, it is quite cold. So when um, when they said, uh, oh, Tara, where is going to be cold? It's 10. I went, oh, try minus two. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I had um, leggings on, wet weather pants, three layers of merino, a jacket and a beanie and gloves. Um, And I came into the aid station three in the morning. Um, And what I did wrong this year was, I don't know why, but I I was hot up the top and I decided to have a bit of flat coke and and I don't do that. So I'm a real foods person. And it just made me... So I really struggled in the gut department, but um, my support crew were awesome um, and a cup of coffee, which was awesome, and some mandarins and just got the gut back going again. I was away and then I was just fine. I just you know, kept going then. But it doesn't let up. You've got that death of despair and it's just like it hits you the second time. So it's not one. It's, it, it's a head game. 
But as I say, a lot of people fail. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't get past the 110k mark. They chop it off or side by side off or I think 10 people got carted off last year only because coming unprepared. Is a head game though, mm-hmm. just like tomorrow will be. Yeah, and as you say, a very different type of course, a, a much more runnable course. Yeah, I'm I'm actually looking forward to it. Um, but again, I, you know, I'm not a young person. You know, I'm, oh come on. <laughs> well, you know, it's. Uh, I always say age is just a number. You know, it's 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 nothing. And but when you put it on the tape measure, you go, deep it's George. There's not a lot left. So um, I got to make the most of it. But yeah, tomorrow I'm gonna have to look after myself, and it will be hot, and you got to keep that fluid up, and um, and just keep your head. Yeah. We live at sea level. <laughs> That's about all you can really say, isn't it? Like we, we've got friends who've done North Burn and, and, and they talk about that, you know, the 25K climb and I just sort of scratch my head even thinking about Kepler going up to Luxmore and that's that's probably 8K, you know, yeah, quite a decent climb. But I couldn't imagine doubling that. And then, yeah. and then again, you were talking about, you know, you said you nailed it. 2018, you got North Burn, the UTA, and then you were off to UTMB. What happened? Um, yeah, it was um, it was an interesting one. So I I ran um, rode a ro- no, sorry, I ran Route Burn, Milford Track, Kepler, um, a back to back, and then flew home. Had a day's guiding and came home and trained some clients in the gym and oh, I'll go and get a coffee and walked across the pedestrian crossing and there was no cars I didn't see any cars but I can't remember a lot but um, all I know is that this guy was doing 50k hit me on a pedestrian crossing and threw me 20 meters um, that actually took me a long time to get my head round um, going down the black tunnel with the fireworks because no one would tell me, no doctor would tell me what had happened, but it was when they woke me up, um, that's when the pain hit. And I thought, you know, I just it was just incredible. So I had um, a bit of a smashed up body. Um, you know, I had uh, eight broken ribs in three and four places and collapsed lung with holes in the lung, neck injury, and but I had a real brain injury um, and internal injury, so which took time to come right. But the brain injury... That actually took me four years to come right because the headaches, um, the headaches were horrendous, and it's just um, yeah, you just can't. You looking back now, I understand rugby players, what their brain. I tried to run. I kept thinking, start running pole, get the endorphins going. You know, you've got UTMB in August. You've got to keep training, but it was like. A watermelon sloshing in my brain and and then I'd come back and I'd start vomiting and just you know and you have bad thoughts you are in a deep black hole and it's every time you try to climb the mountain you fell back in the hole again um, and then one morning four years later I mean I tried everything and I remember the all black doctor said to me Paul don't put too much in front of you but you'd go and do stupid things like you know Put your going to put your car and trade me your skis, your kayak, your all your bikes and just dumb ass stuff, you know. And but it's just your head is not your head. It's it's something in there that's really, really messed up. And I started James Kugler actually got me into um, Chris Vickers. He's a chiropractor, more holistic, and he started working on my brain plates um, and just everything, you know, like fixing my back, fixing fixing everything that was wrong and my ribs and all that sort of stuff. So I go I go to him every week. I've been doing that since 2019 um, and he's been really good. He's just banged the body back into gear and then I decided to have a sports nutritionist because I thought, you know, if I'm going to do Northburn 100, which I did back in, in um, March, I tried the Kepler. Um, it was okay. I finished okay. But I shouldn't have done it. You know, there's two races I should never have done because the recovery was way too long. Um, and I'd just start crying. I was going, what the bloody hell? Toughen up, girl. And, you know, it wouldn't mean whatever you tried. It just, you knew, you knew you had to just go and have a rest and shut your eyes with no noise. But I couldn't handle noise. And it's just an interesting, 
you know, channel to go down or a road to go down and, yeah, just – but anyway, we got through it and and then uh, surprised everybody by heading back racing. But it wasn't the first time. I'd smashed my pelvis in four places and cracked a hip socket, you know, training for Ironman in 2009. So I don't like the 2019 or 2009. That nine's got a bit of an issue. So, you know, you just – and then I went in and did coast to coast five times. So it doesn't really – you just pick yourself up and go again because – You've got one crack at life. Just make the most of it. And so the journey now is coming back. And, um, yeah, we got to try and um, do well and get back to UTMB in Chamonix. And if I don't, well, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just lively stuff, giving a good crack. But while I do TDS this year, there is an opening. So um, it's just I'm not going to make a decision till tomorrow or Sunday. Um, but tedious, maybe. It's a mountain run. Mm-hmm. There's big climbs. So, yeah, means I have to try climb Tappy a few times. And <laughs> yeah, no, it's tough. It was, it, was, it was tough for everybody, my partner, my children. Mm, it was hard. And, you know, for you as somebody who's fit and active to suddenly not be as well, but you'd been through that before in 2009. I that, you know, so I guess had that given you the experience, the knowledge to be able to, well, I don't want to use the word handle, but you know, to be able to cope with that sudden, you know, you're fit and healthy, then a moment happens and you you can't run. I think the difference of the 2009 accident is my head was fine; it never got hit, but my pelvis was, it was, it was, you know, four places in a cracked hip socket was, mm. I guess, it was broken. So, you know, I had a bit of a long time in a wheelchair and crutches and everything. But this time it was different because my head had been really, you know, yeah. And that, yeah, that took took its toll. But I think, you know, sometimes I look back and I go, hmm, you know what? 100-mile racing is all about the top two inches. A brain injury, you just got to be patient. And there's the top two inches. It'll it'll come back. Just be patient. And um, yeah, and I this time I think I probably should get James Cougar's client of the year because I really listened to him now, whereas before I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if he says go and run ten k, I'll go and run twenty k or thirty k, or you know, I just you know. So yeah, I, I listen. I listen to him. My sports nutritionist, I did everything he said um, because if you want to come back, um, these professionals are the ones that will get you back. Yeah. I wish people would listen to your advice in terms of, especially with the TBI, because we see so much of it, don't we, like people with long-lasting effects because it's not something that you can muscle through and you touched on it too the you know that the organicity can affect mood can affect like you said those putting your car and trade me doing that impulsive stuff you know it's how was it a gradual process or was there any points where you were like heck i'm really making making a stride here like a gate that you went through, or was it just that kind of big climb and then suddenly you're sort of noticing things that are better? I think at the start my goal was UTMB. And I remember the police saying, well, if anybody can do it, you can do it. What a comeback. And that was my goal because it's so hard to get into UTMB. And it's harder now because... There's not many races in the Southern Hemisphere. It's all Northern Hemisphere. So I tried hard, but I was just making it worse. Like I would, there's just so many different things happen and you're just, yeah. uh, So I had to, it was my chiropractor. I went in there one day and I just was in tears. I was in a mess and, but I had, you know, I had the, the guts to just walk in and say, look, I'm not in a good shape. And You know, he just, it was, I think that was the turning point where he said, right, um, and we spoke about it last week. I said, you know, if it hadn't been for you, I actually don't know if I'd be here. 
And he said, oh, I always had faith that you would. I just had to work on the plates in your brain and every all your, all your, you know, your all your body. Um, and it was, I think it. Once he said to me, "I want you to go home, and spend only twenty minutes. It's all you have to do. Lie on the couch, turn everything off, and just hear the birds." And then when I started doing that, I started getting better because the headaches would just the headaches would drive you mad. You just they. You know, like my poor partner, honestly, he would eat yogurt and it sounded like a bloody horse eating chaff. And I went, this is just, you know, it was so loud in your brain. And, um, yeah, so once that happened, and it was really four years, I felt it was going out a little bit. And then one day I woke up and I went, oh, my goodness, I don't have a head- headache. I went, wow, the headaches are gone. Um I still get headaches. I have to look after myself after this race because the headaches will come back. It's just knowing what's right and what's wrong. How was that for you? I mean, if you look at you on, I'm looking at you on paper, pretty impressive. Fundamentally unkillable, it would appear, and tough as old boots. What was it like, actually? That must have been very difficult for you to say, hey, I can't do this or I'm struggling with this, I'm in a bad place. It was and it was really terrible because the guy that hit me, um, I was just so angry with him because he took UTMB away from me Mm. and he wasn't remorseful at all. Um, He just, it was was just terrible. but then I tried to say, well, it wasn't his fault. He didn't get up in the morning, so I'm going to run someone down. It's just, you know, <clears throat> one of these things. But it didn't take it away that he's taken everything away from me. And, yeah, I cried. I'd get up on a hill and I'd just bore my eyes out. And and then I'd have to talk to myself again. So, yeah, it's one of these things. It's in behind me now. <laughs> yeah, well, well so – when you mentioned that moment when you woke up without a headache, was there a moment where you thought, oh, I'm going to be able to run, you know, and run well again? Um, if something's taught me with this last accident is that it's what Deb Robinson said, don't put too much in front of you. So James Coogan and I came up with a plan and sometimes – he probably annoyed me because I wanted to do more races than he said. Um, but we kept the racing really light and because I wanted to do Cosy Costco. And then it was the snakes. And I said, well, look, if I do Cosy Costco, I need to do Northburn because I love Northburn. And he goes, no, you're not doing both. I went, hmm. So I did Kepler and I had a really good Kepler. I couldn't believe it. I just thought, oh, something's happened here. Um, and I said, oh, I want to do the one in um, – Queen Arrowtown. He said, no, you're not doing that. And I said, oh, come on. I've got an entry. No, you're not doing it. Okay. And then I said to him one day, I said, oh, well, I think we've buggered up our bloody UTM points. He said, just focus on Tarawera. So once we got that sort of, I mean, I've, I had a really good year last year racing and, um, you know, I just, yeah, it's yeah, something come out of the bag. I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, so, yeah, I, I do listen to him and I just – I think now it's just about ticking the boxes and, you know, if it happens, UTMB, and I get an entry, well, that's pretty cool. And it was meant to be. But there's something has taught me is just don't stress about the small crap because it's not worth it, you know. It's just find something else. Mm. It will not be crocheting, I can tell you that. (laughs) I'm picking it won't be crocheting. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, you said you had one out of the box last year and things went well. Um, obviously, James has been a big influence, but what else has it been that has meant that you have been able to you know, rebuild and, and, and come back as strong as you have? I mean, you say that you're running better than you ever have. What What is the secret sauce? I think... Um I think it's three people. It's well, family, of course, but it's James Coog- James Coogler, um, Ascent Nutrition, 
uh, and um, Chris Vickers, chiropractor. Ascent Nutrition, um, he's based in Tauranga. Um, he's he's quite a quite a tough guy, you know. I think I think he was, I I could be wrong, but I think he was SAS. So he he doesn't stand any crap. One race I went into and he says, right, I want you to have this for you, for for your fluid. I went, oh, don't do that on bloody race day. And then he um he said how'd it go? And I said, oh, you know, I had a win, but he said, oh, that you tri- the the fluid worked well. And I said, oh no, I didn't do it. And whoa. So I really got a wad over that, and I went, mm, okay, all right. So then I said to him, look, mate, if you're going to get shitty with me, pick up the bloody phone, don't just text me, and we'll have a chat about it. We've got on really well since, mm. and um, he just thinks I'm crazy. So, yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he turns up at the finish line, but we've got to get to the finish line first. It's going to be hot out there tomorrow. It sure is. It's going to be hot. Um, nutrition. I mean, we we just did a you know, Q and A with some elites, and we we're asking some of them what's the what's the key thing. You know, what is it that takes? What is it that it that you know means that you can do well? All of them said nutrition. So, yeah, nutrition is the big thing. Um, yeah. What does it look like for you? Nutrition so varied. You talked about you were sort of a real food person. Give us an example of not, not unless it's sec- it literally is secret uh, so sauce. Not, Give us a yes a uh, snapshot for, for race day or normal everyday living. Just for race day. So tomorrow. oh race day. Okay, so um my um my fluid in the back is very interesting because it's zero Powerade with Himalayan salt. Wow. Just basic, no high octane octane stuff. It's just basic. Then I'll have drink a lot of plain water. Um, uh, I'll also have a thing, I, I, I can't pronounce it right, it's called a stucky, so it's chia seeds, lemon, honey and water. Just old basic endurance stuff. Um, I'll have a banana with a bit of peanut butter in there and I'll have peanut butter slugs and I'll, I will have some street waffles. Um, but Kepler, I had I had a really good race last year at Kepler and I, I ate um, one and a quarter bananas. I had two peanut butter slugs, one street waffle and half an orange, and that was my whole 60K food. But the orange tasted really good. So, yeah, I'm going to – you know, it could all go pear-shaped tomorrow. You just don't know. You just got to – who knows? My support crew got a job on their hands anyway. <laughs> They'll have all this food, and I go, yeah, nah, nah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Pumpkin suit and potatoes with lots of salt on is always my go-to. Naseby last year, yes. the – potatoes with salt oh my god that was it it was i think i could have died and gone to heaven after having some of those that's it really is magic it is it is this guy at north Bruin. he left the the marquee with a bag full of potatoes (laughs) i couldn't believe it i was feeling bad by taking three potatoes but you know potatoes are um potatoes are actually just that rocket fuel at the end of the day you know you can you you've got to be so careful putting too much sugar into your stomach. It just it just like you know it's yeah. It it's, can do the nasties. It's interesting, isn't it? When you look at we were just having a conversation before, weren't we, Eugene, with someone who um, was talking about how this weekend it's almost people to varying degrees or not treat it as a license to kind of it doesn't reflect their normal nutritional intake. Over the week, over the week, you know, this person had um, got some fast food and was like, "Oh, I don't normally do this." We're like, "Look, you go, you do." You know, this is a big week weekend. You, you, you know, you do the heart wants what the heart wants. But it's so interesting, isn't it, that you talk about that sort of that simplicity of food, like and 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 you as well, you do potatoes and salt. It's a real. It seems like that real North American thing, eh? Like people talk also about like they have cheese quesadillas, which is essentially like a tortilla toasty of cheese. How nice that feels, rather than brand X goo, a uh, goopy, not goo. That's not a shot of goo. Maybe edit that out. <laughs> Sorry, goo. Uh, but that th- you know, I remember starting running and thinking, oh. You know, ex professional athlete eats twenty of these on a run. I'll have, the, and then you're just thinking, "This is horrible. What am I doing?" Mm. Yeah, I just um, look. Bananas are a good one, you know. But you got there. There's a fine line with everything. Uh, what you eat, you just got to be. I think if you if you keep your fluid intake up to you, the salt is a big secret. 
I feel. I mean, I sweat like one thing. It's just, yeah. And and the salt, if you're losing it, you've got to put it back in. So I, to be honest, I used to have other other drinks, but uh, I tried a new one on uh, Northburn and, you know, that just did not work well at all. So we've gone back to the old, you know, zero parade and rock salt. I mean, Himalayan salt, it's sort of, you know, uh-huh. it's... Oh, Giannis Kouris, the the great ultra runner, came out here and ran. I think I've told the story before on Church, but he came and ran around Lake Taupo in I can't remember what year it was, but our friends Gary and Sean were crewing for him, and all he wanted was one third of a banana every fifteen minutes, and it wasn't a quarter, it wasn't a half, it was a third. Wow. Yeah. See, I have a I had um, quarters at um, Kepler, and, you know, that's all you need, really. The temperatures at Kepler were pretty good, I have to say. It wasn't stinking hot. It was just, it was really, really nice weather, nice running weather. And um, and, and I was really naughty because I actually had it Irish beer and I had a piece of Christmas cake, which I don't eat anything like that, but that was pretty cool too. Oh, that Christmas, Christmas cake at Irish cake. Burn. Oh, that's a, that's a highlight of Irish Burn, it's got to be said. But the other thing about, eating real food, and this is the thing I always struggle with is how do you carry it? Because it, it always ends up scrunched and unpalatable and blah, if I'm if I'm carrying it myself. Are you carrying things when you're out training and, and how do you Not, do that? Um, so for me, I have taught the body to run two hours with no fluid or food. Yeah. And I make, because I eat five meals a day, um, which is lots and lots and lots of vegetables. You know, I'm probably a rabbit because I eat a lot of salad. Um, and chicken or, you know, a pro- form of protein. Um, so my body uses what it's already had put into it um, and then I'll refill afterwards when I get home. Mm. So um, and that might be a protein shake or something, yeah. Longer than two-hour runs? Do you do? You do? Um, so for when I get to the three hours, that's when I, um, when I start to eat, really, yeah, which is a peanut butter slug, a bit of banana, or a street waffle, something like that, yeah. Keep it simple. I got a bit of baby food on board this time. Oh. God help me. But anyway, we'll, you know, and, and that's quite nice too. Um, yeah, so there's a bit of, yeah, organic baby food. Up to two plus, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Scrape in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> but I am also going to do a wrap with peanut butter and uh, jam, raspberry jam. That'd be quite nice too. It's just to keep that going, but it's not too in your face mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then the guys will have um i said to them you know I, I every ski season i allow myself to have one almond croissant so i said to them you can bring an almond croissant it's no guarantees i'll eat it but you know i just feel i might want it about o- otitana mm-hmm. got big long words up here i tell you um i might like it then so yeah yeah i yeah, know yeah. what about that one that starts with r <laughs> uh, I when, when I did the miler in 2020, uh, my poor son lugged around a chili bin full of all the things that I thought I was going to need. And of course, I, I after 60 car, I couldn't need anything. So, yeah, but he would dutifully turn up at every aid station with the selection and mm. I would say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, honestly, that's what happened at Northburn last year. Um, but there's nothing like a good cup of coffee. We went down at Northburn, we went down into the... Oh, down into the, it's sort of a, oh, down, you've got to hang on to ropes and so on. And um, there was a guy at the top, and he'd done God's own. He said, oh, would you like a cup of coffee? I said, oh, man, it's the Pope Catholic. He's play. I thought he was joking. He had perk coffee. <laughs> oh, in a Subway cup. I thought it was seventh <laughs> heaven. I went all the way down to the water race with my cup of coffee. And <laughs> Does Terry Davis know this sort of luxury exists on the North Burn course? <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah, no, he's uh, he's he's pretty good. It, it's a re- I think it's one that everyone should do. You know, if you want a tough one, you should do it. Yeah. What what is it? So obviously Tarawera is a stepping stone, hopefully. To UTMB, how does how does that work? Can you have you figured out how what that step is? What is what will it take for you to get there? Um, so you get four running stones, uh, and we, whereas years ago it was six points, you had to have max of fifteen points. But so now it's running stones. Um, so I've already got one running stone. Um, so if you finish, that'll give me a total of six running stones. But you also get other 
other points as well, which will allow you to enter um, races. Like you'll get, they'll, they'll send you an email to say, right, you can enter UTMB because you've got enough of those ITR, whatever that, those points. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I guess if you, like I think Dan Jones has got the third most points or second most points in the world. Like, you know, because he just keeps racing these different races. So, yeah, and I uh, I'd, I guess we'll see what happens. Um, and then going from here, you just, look, you know, I've just got to tick tomorrow's box off. Mm-hmm. And then if the points are there, that's great. Then I, I have this unfinished business. So when I... Finally, the medics said, look, you cannot do UTMB in 2019. Um, that was a real bitter pill to swallow. Um, and I just went, God, life sucks. And then I think of, yeah, it might be, but you're still here. There's other people that have died would wish they were here. So I thought, we'll just get your shit together and and think about something else. But what actually happened as well is that um, I, it, I I felt it wasn't all over because I actually had a medical medical report, so I could send it to France, and we had a certain date to get it sent there, and then they were going to let me know they were going to defer it to the following year, um, and then of course COVID happened and so on and so on. But the sad thing with the medical report, it got lost, mm. so that happened as well, and my sister said, look, you know. You're just not meant to be going over there. So, you know, as it turned out, it took four years for the brain to come right. I probably, even if they had accepted my entry and I went there, I probably would have got a DNF. And mm. then that's such a total waste of money. Um, did it cost a lot of money? Yes, it did. Um, did we get it back? No, we didn't. Um, the accident went to court and, um, yeah, he, yeah, it's just, it's just life. You just got to suck it up and get on with the next one and you know hey that's what this journey is all about is we're doing Tarawera to try and qualify and get picked out of the lottery for UTMB so if you're listening out there guys pick me <laughs> <laughs> but that that's the thing isn't it is is you know you've got this goal but you've got to, you've still got to run a bloody 100 miles so it's being able to keep in this game because if you don't then the other thing's not going to happen. So it's it's a real mm. mind game, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I, I, I think, and I probably shouldn't say this, but you know what? I just shoot from the hip anyway. So I think if you had two events, if you had, if you if you look at UTMB in Chamonix, I mean, I we've been there uh, on Tour de France, love the place. So you look at these two events. UTMB is really mountains. It's real mountains. It's Italy, Switzerland, France. You got Northburn, total climbing of forty thousand feet. You got Tarawera. They say you got to climb seven hundred meters. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Um, that's only one and a quarter of Mount Vernon. It's it's really nothing, you know. So for me, the the points should be at Northburn mm. or a race like that because you want to know that your athletes can climb mountains, you know, although running on the flat's pretty hard as well. Don't get me wrong. It's all hard. I'm going to be having a board meeting with myself all day, tomorrow and night. So, But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, yeah. If, if UTMB is a really tough one, so therefore maybe I should look at TDS, which is way tougher than UTMB. But then I think, oh, God, Paul, you're 64. What are you doing? Well, it doesn't really matter. Good CV, eh? <laughs> you're it's unbel- only 145k you're unbelievable Polly <laughs> and I guess you're unbelievable because it's that thing isn't it and, and to use a kuglerism, um the manner in which you express your health you know and, 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 and there's so much made of you know these green belts in the world and people living to a I mean it, it, what it reminds me is, is we're sort of fundamentally we're meant to move you know, and there's a real, yeah. and there's a privilege to that too. You know, we can be in a place where we can enjoy movement, freedom of movement, and all that sort of stuff. But I, I wouldn't, I'm, 
I'm not betting on anything against you, Polly, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I wouldn't put my house on it, mate, that you won't be tying the line at U10B next year. Well, you know, that's that is the dream. Um I have a I have a thing where, you know, um the sun comes up, the sun comes down, and what happens during the day and night time, well, so be it. You just get on with it, you know, and there's something about coming out of the dark zone and you've got daylight and it's like, oh, I've got a brand new body now. You've already done, you know, 20 odd hours. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, interesting. I'm aware that you've got to run 100 miles tomorrow and you've been generous with your time, but you've got to go and Rest the feet. Rest the feet. Look after yourself. We'll leave you with one more question. We ask it of everyone that comes on Dirt Church Radio. Polly Taylor, what's been your greatest run ever? Oh, what's my greatest run ever? I think if you'd asked me this question on Monday, I, I, I could have a different answer, but I, I, I love North Bend 100 Miler. Because it's a race where you've just got to get the job done. You turn up at the start line um, and you just get the job done. But you're also very aware of the other competitors that are around you. So, yeah, you're watching them. <laughs> I bet they're watching. More likely they're watching you. Polly, that was, <laughs> that was fantastic. Like, we will see you tomorrow morning mm. at yes. Kawaro. Uh We'll be there. and. You know, rest well and have a beautiful day tomorrow. Certainly you've you've earned your place on that start line. Well, thank you so much, guys. I was uh um it's been a privilege with, you know, speaking to you guys, but I also um would like to say thank you to James Kugler, um, Chris Vickers, my chiropractor, Ascent Nutrition, um, Phil, and also my um I've been privileged enough to be an ambassador for Last Sportiva. So without them, um it has made my life a little bit easier, my running shoes and clothes and lecky poles and all those things. So um, without them, it, uh, well, put, let's just put it this way, it makes life a wee bit easier for you. So, yeah, yeah it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much and send it tomorrow. I was lucky enough to be on the mic when Polly finished her miler on Sunday morning at Tarawera. When I say finish, I mean she absolutely owned its ass in 28 hours and 28 minutes. She had a crew there, she won her division, she looked so, so happy. There were tears, there were hugs, and there was a dream burning so, so strongly, still alive. It was palpable, it was incredible, and we feel so fortunate to have met you Polly we can't wait to see you keep chasing your dreams and thank you so much for your inspiration and just yeah that reminder that life is here for living and and cut a few would go after it what a what a better get you in your your hivers and onto the yeah. gravel for your, for, your, for, your tri- for your trip home. It's Back nice though, actually, gear. if you think of it. So just a little thing. Though. Yeah. We both made our sort of, well, our New Year's resolutions. This is the first time, sitting in my car, this is the first time all year, it's it's now nearly March, that I have used a car mm. to get to run. And uh, yeah, so cutting down on those cutting down on those emissions but thank you very much for tuning in we're on social media at Dirt Church Radio you can email us at dirtchurchradio at gmail.com now don't forget to sign in and up to the new podcast and newsletter on Substack don't forget to write them with your greatest run ever we'd love to hear from you as Tanya pointed out it inspires people so get amongst it you can read them on the website too but once you've done that send them into us dirtchurchradio at gmail.com thanks to our sponsors Scott Running Further Faster Currens Cielli and our Substack subscribers and the DCR Aid Station crew stay tuned for our show in two weeks and we have another great guest lined up and check out the DCR Aid Station next week hey kona hey kona thanks Rigby <laughs>